from uh, Nanoracks. I spoke yesterday, maybe some of you uh, were here talking about Nanoracks, the first uh, company to own and market our own hardware on the International Space Station. But this afternoon, I want to go backwards and uh, tell you about a company that uh, I managed before, uh, at the turn of the century, and uh, it's called Mircorp. And it was a significant company in that it really paved the way uh, for this, uh, we believe it paved the way for this generation of commercial space companies. It was a failure, and I'll get into why it was a failure and what we set out to do, um, but sometimes what is a failure for you investors or failure at the time really has some legacy and continuation to it. Um, sort of like maybe the early computer models that didn't quite make it or the tablets that didn't really go anywhere, they paved the way for the other stuff. But before I talk about Mircorp, I do want to talk a little bit about how Mircorp came about. And we got to go back to about uh, the end of the Cold War, War, 1990, 1991. At that time, especially, I think a lot of you in this room are familiar with ITAR. Well, I don't think ITAR existed in 92, but that whole concept certainly erected a huge barrier between the American space program and the Soviet space program. The Soviet space program was just this dark, unknowing, we, we knew nothing about it. You weren't allowed to talk to the engineers, they weren't allowed to talk to us. And with the collapse of the Cold War, there was a group of people, including myself, that said, wait a second, it's time for us to talk to the Russians. We were having trouble with space station freedom, it was massively over budget, nothing had been built, and NASA indeed had probably lost the even understanding of how to do a complex manned orbiting platform. And, and so I got fascinated by trying to bridge uh, the Russians and the Americans, and in 91, I guess, I carried over the first contract between NASA and the Soviet Union, it was to use Soyuz, as an escape vehicle for space station freedom. And the contract was between uh, NASA headquarters and the, the organization Energia. Do you guys know Energia? It's the, yeah, it's the Russian uh, um, sort of equivalent of Boeing and Johnson Space Center. They, they uh, build the uh, components, they built the first few modules of International Space Station, they launched the Progress, they launched the Soyuz, very, uh, they did Sputnik, uh, they were the organization that did Yuri Gagarin. So this was a proud, strong organization, and they wanted to work with America. And I was one of a handful of people that were trying to make that come about. And funny enough, we were probably more successful than we ever thought we could possibly be. Because first we got the contract to use the Soyuz as an escape vehicle. And then the, the Russians brought me in, and we opened a Washington office called Energia USA. And uh, for nine years, I was the only, I'm the only American to have ever worked for the Russian space program. So I sat opposite NASA. I sat, sat with the Russians. And step by step, we integrated the Russian and American space programs. And I worked, uh, I was the American rep for Energia. And I remember when uh, the Russians and Boeing were so excited, they spent a weekend mapping out, let's get rid of freedom, let's just end freedom the space station, and let's come up with something that really takes what we've learned from the Russian space station Mir, with what Boeing can do. They went off to Seattle, they worked it out, they came back, they showed it to Dan Golden, the head of NASA, he said yes, we got the vice presidents on board, uh, Vice President Gore and uh, the Prime Minister on board, and then Clinton said yes, and boom, suddenly we had International Space Station. Uh, I was part of a group that helped change the inclination because freedom, of course, was going to be just in the shuttle inclination, 20, whatever it was, 20-something, instead of the 56, uh, I think it is. Um, so there was a lot that we take for granted today. This must be New York, right? So there's, there's a lot that we take for granted today in, in the international nature of the space station, uh, which had to come about because of the work that was done in the 90s. So that was all kind of good. I mean, people were a little bothered by what I was doing, but it was necessary. And, uh, and then I, I left working with the Russians. I went to do some other things. And then there was extraordinary pressure being brought by the American government to bring down the Russian Mir space station. 
And a lot of us, including folks here today, um, uh, Rick Tomlinson, uh, uh, Jim Muncy, who just spoke at lunch, were dismayed at the idea of deorbiting a perfectly good station. It was old, but you know what? ISS is beginning to get old, too. And, uh, but it was old, and we didn't want to take it down. The Americans wanted it down because they were concerned it was taking resources away from the Russians. And so they announced, the Russian government announced, that the Mir was coming down. And they agreed with NASA that about when it would come down, and it was 1999. Well, unbeknownst to my shock, NASA did not really focus that the Russian government no longer controlled the Mir. The Mir had been privatized and Energia now owned it. So the Russian government could sit there in 99 and talk about all they want, that, the, that we agree the Mir is coming down. And I, I find this hard to believe to this day, but NASA folks who were senior leadership and, uh, was that Bush? Bush one, I think, senior leadership, tell me that they did not know that the Mir had been privatized. So the Mir was coming down, Energia did not want to bring it down. Kind of a dramatic situation. And there were all sorts of people coming up with solutions. The Russians went to the United Nations and they offered to give the Mir to the United Nations, but the Americans blocked that, wouldn't let it happen. So then the Russians went and said, why don't we take pieces of the Mir and make it part of ISS? Again, the Americans wouldn't let that happen. They wanted the Mir in the ocean. And it was supposed to be in the ocean by 99. And then a, a guy, I think, you, do, do you folks in the room know Walt Anderson? The story of Walt Anderson? Yeah, Walt Anderson was an extraordinary contributor uh, to commercial space in the 90s. Uh, a lot of the things that uh, commercial projects he uh, uh, helped uh, get off the ground, he helped finance ISU, the International Space University in the beginning. I don't know his role with this organization, but I'm sure he was a contributor early on. He ended up going to jail for tax uh, evasion. And, uh, but in the turn of the century, um, in 98, 99, Walt came in and said, and I was no longer really working with the Russians. I had left, but he came to me anyway, and he said, I want to buy the Mir. And I'm like, well, you can't buy the Mir. It's like buying the Statue of Liberty. And he came a couple of times, and Rick Tomlinson, who I think is here, is like calling me up and going, man, we can buy the mirror. Oh man, Walt's got the money, we can buy the mirror. I'm like, Rick, you can't buy the mirror. <laughs> so I go to the Russians, no longer working with them, but I get on a plane, I go to Moscow, I talk to them. They would be willing to lease the mirror, okay? The way you lease an apartment, or the way you lease a facility. You know, and so I went back to Walt and I said, okay, you can lease the mirror, and over time, very quickly, the, because the decision was they were launching a progress, and that the progress was supposed to deorbit the station, begin to pull it down. So Yuri Semyonov, the head of Energia, had to make a decision: does he go against his government, against his government? I mean, I mean and and keep, boot, launch that progress and boost the mirror, or does he bring it back down the way his government wants? And so, um, oops, so that gives you the background of Mircorp because we decided to go ahead and uh, uh, we decided to go ahead and, uh, in fact, I forget the date, so let's see. First, history of the Mir space. So that gives you the background of how Mircorp, the, the political scenario. Now, let me just quickly walk you through Mircorp. So, first, first off, um, the Mir space station. Are you guys familiar with the Mir space station? Not really, okay. It was the world's first permanent uh, home in space. And uh, far more than, uh, than uh, ISS, it was a home. They had guitars on it, you know, they showed films, they had, you know, little vodka. It was, it was a home, it was a home. Uh, NASA went crazy, went crazy when they found out there was booze on the, st on the mirror. Um, but anyway, so, so in everything about ISS comes from the mirror and the idea of the docking, the modules, okay? Uh, on ISS, you use the Energia docking system. On ISS, you use the Russian uh, ha um, habituate of uh, recycling. The basics on ISS were tested, developed, and done on Mir. And of course, every nation is blind to what it does and what it borrows, but we are particularly blind in this country as to how much in this community, in this community, as to how much 
we needed the Russians to do International Space Station. It isn't just the Progress cargo ships. It isn't just the Soyuz. It's the whole basic understanding by 97, 98, 99. We were in trouble at NASA as to how you do uh, keep a station and people aloft for a decade. So anyway, this gives you the history. Um, and uh, we signed uh, uh, the lease. Uh, what's in this? Okay. So the business model for Miracorp was that could you use an orbiting platform for, for other than science? And remember, this is 99. And also remember, Mir was the butt of jokes. Late night TV, things were leaking. They would joke about it, oh, send up some borscht. And, I mean, you know, it was just, it, this was after the Cold War. The Russians were very weak. You know, they were pretty broke. And so the Mir was seen as a symbolism of everything wrong with Russia. Decrepit, falling apart. We saw it as a beautiful, state-of-the-art, permanent home in space that should be saved. But the question was, could, could you use it to, to a business model? Is, could you use it for revenue other than the standard uses of science? We held a press conference in London to announce the signing of the agreement between Energia and Mircorp, and it was Mr. Semyonov, the head of Energia. I was asked to be the head of Mircorp. I didn't really want to do it at first. And Walt, they thought I was just joking, but I had just finished, you know, nine years of working with the Russians. And I was so happy not to be working with the Russians anymore in the trips. But I mean, never mind, you know, but just the trips back and forth, the cold, the cultural differences. And now they're saying, do you want to take on a project that your government's going to be, you know, pissed at you? Um, but I did it. Okay, I'm a romantic. And, uh, and so when we announced the, uh, the um, project in London, you had it, all the world media was there. And because you remember, you're defying the Russian government, you're keeping the spit station up, and everybody was serious, you know, they're reporters. When we got to the part, when we got to the part that we were going to try and sell tickets for people to go to the mirror, the reporters laughed. And reporters don't do that. I mean, that's like really unprofessional. They're like, people are going to pay to go into Soyuz? You're out of your mind. But part of the business model was space tourism. Part of it was media and some science. Um, uh, two investors, with Walt being the principal, put in a, a little over 20 million, and Energia matched it. That is forgotten in a lot of the accounts on Mircorp. The Russians matched it. And, and uh, we went to McKinsey, we got a business plan, we went to KPMG for evaluation, we went out to uh, try and raise further money. The principal factor, of course, was political risk. The Russian government was against it, and the American government was against it. Other than that, have a nice day. So we didn't. Our initial plan was to boost it into a higher orbit, but State Department held that the uh, using a tether, uh, and and uh, that was the initial plan was to boost it into a higher orbit to take um, a, a year maybe and figure out what the hell to do with the station, and uh, we never had that chance. Uh, because the State Department held up the uh, tether technology being transferred to the Russians. Uh, to this day, I mean, we know that, that it was done for political reasons. The day we announced our failure, the day we announced that the Mir would be coming down, the State Department announced they approved our export license. Uh, so we kind of got the hint with that. So, um, so we went out and, and uh, we announced... Um, I can't see what this I haven't done this presentation so long. Oh, there it is. Okay. So we went out and we announced uh, that uh, we effectively controlled, the, had a lease on the Mir, and uh, we explained that the Prime Minister of Russia had privatized it. Um, we made Mir a Dutch company for Russian sensibilities. We didn't want the conservative elements in Russia saying, oh, the Americans have taken over our heritage. So we made it a Dutch company. And the other thing we did was we let the Russians' Energia have 60% of the company. This made our investors, business team, really upset because we were putting in the capital. But again, there was just no way the Russians were going to allow foreigners to come in and, and even lease their space station. But what we got, so we signed the lease in January of 99, and what we signed for was two progress missions and one man Soyuz. Think about that. I mean, that is friggin' cool. I mean, we signed the lease saying, we didn't really sign the lease, for, and we would, uh, we would be responsible for, for the business development of the Mir, and we would pay in their gear for the ops. So it was a very mature, very realistic model. 
After we sign the lease, three weeks later, the progress takes off, first time in history of, of a privately funded cargo ship. And it docked with the Mir and it boosted it up. I mean, it's just, I mean, the Russian government could not have been more angry. The American government was furious. It was legal. It was completely legal. Uh, key, key events, uh, this thing blinks on and off. Uh, you can see starting uh, from the left, uh, the, the key milestones in Mir Corp uh, with the, uh, uh, I think I have the demise in there, yeah. Yeah, we announced an IPO near the end and then finally the Russian government just came in and said, and, and to be blunt with you now, uh, the, the end really came about uh, with the collapse of the dot, dot com. Uh, we couldn't raise the money that we thought we could the second round. And also, the Americans pr uh, did linkage. They went to the Russians and said, before we continue on these other ballistic missile questions, we want that mirror in the ocean. And once they made it a linked issue on a very higher level than, than the commercial space community, the manned space community, it was over. I mean, it's just... Um, can you uh, click the, um, yeah, the video? This is, uh, do you guys know the movie Orphans of Apollo? Okay, so you know everything, see that? So uh, this is a trailer uh, on the movie which talks about Mir Corp. The U.S. government spent billions of dollars going to the moon and got there. Um, and, you know, just as an encounter, everybody got color television sets. And they got to the moon, it was pretty well black and white. 1972, Apollo 17, last mission on the moon. And during the Nixon administration, shut it down. We, as Apollo's children, felt we were Apollo's orphans. We had been left out in the cold. It was over in the government's minds, but a lot of young kids there, myself included, were ready for what was next. The right chemistry, the right mix. The that's right Walt matrix. Anderson, that's People Michael Potter to his left, to his well, right, the producer of the movie. That's Walt. Well, craziness. Okay, a whole lot of craziness. That's some of Walt. Right, that's what Tom wants to with Walt. Let's change the future. Walt pulled together an ad hoc group of people that he knew, and it wasn't so much a company, it was more kind of entourage. I take great umbrage on that statement that it wasn't a company. <laughs> Makes for an exciting documentary. Gordon did negotiate a deal to open a frontier in a place that felt like a frontier at the time. Here you had a serious situation to take over the manned space station. Would you like the space station? Because I think we can get it. We had a mega business plan that was going to grow into probably the biggest business plan ever. The audacity of leasing a 130 ton space asset and privatizing it is, is the realm of science fiction. The extraordinary moment when they opened that hatch on our mission. That's Dan Golden, that's administrator. He was not a happy boy. So that's the trailer for the documentary Orphans of Apollo, and it makes it look far more exciting. I don't know, maybe it was exciting, I don't know, but the trailer's uh, exciting. Next, uh, oh, I did the slides, right, right, right. Um, so this is the Mir crew, uh, crew. It was, uh, we, we made a decision uh, after the progress, uh, boosted the Mir higher. Uh, we began to get business. We, we negotiated a deal with uh, James Cameron uh, where he would do a uh, spacewalk uh, and use an IMAX camera. We negotiated and signed and announced a deal with Mark Burnett of Survivor where they would do a game show where the winner would go to space. The revenue from that would have kept the mirror going for years if it had been successful for three years, let's say. Um, and based on the success we were getting, and that was with NBC, and they even began running commercials for it, and so based on the success of that, uh, Mr. Semyonov and Energia made an extra, I mean, extraordinary decision that they would send the crew, two people, uh, to go back up to the mirror, reopen it, and see how it, how it was doing. It had been shut for not, uh, nine or ten months, and you had never had a, a manned station that had been shut for that long, and it was in poor condition when they last left it. 
And I have to tell you, it was pretty dramatic. I was present for the meetings, decision was made. I mean, you really, it, it comes home to you. These are two humans going up. Mircorp completely funded that mission. And uh, again, it was, it's the, to this day, it's the first uh, and only privately funded manned uh, space crew. And then if you could hit that video. And this was just the moment they're walking out to the rocket. I mean, it was just a pretty awesome moment. And afterwards, we did a private ceremony when they returned. This is the tradition. Welcome there, ready to take off. 115 cosmonauts have gone into space from back now. The Latin is the 116th. We didn't know what we would find when they opened the, uh, the hatch and they found a really bad situation. There were gobs of uh, condensation and fluids, materials, mineral, you know, things that had leaked and it was extremely dangerous. But they... the steps to the elevator. The elevator will take them to the top of the rocket, to the flight spaceships you use fixed under the rocket head. We will take them to the state. So, uh, so they, they found it was quite dangerous, but within a week or two, they had gotten things working. We had paid for a new software system, and for the first time in the history of Mir, you had these bright, colored, sharp images coming down. And people were like, oh, wow, it exists. It's not this blurry Russian thing. I mean, it's, it's, it looks cool. It's a beautiful station. And uh, uh, so that was, that was quite a moment. Very interesting. You know, there's an international federation that keeps records of all manned... Uh, crews that have gone since uh, Gagarin and uh, last time I looked was about three years ago and we still weren't listed on it It's just the Russians never applied for the uh, they were so angry They never applied and the Americans of course never applied so it's really a forgotten mission and uh, So let me go back and say for roughly remember for roughly 40 million dollars 20 million on the Russian side 20 million from private investors. We got two cargo launch vehicles and uh, two cargo vehicles and a manned mission of almost 70 days. And when Dan Golden went up on the hill and complained that he had negotiated a higher rate with Energia, the Americans negotiated a far higher rate, the answer from one of the congressmen, Rowenbacher, was, I guess you didn't negotiate that well, did you? Okay, but there's another point that I tried to make at the time, and it's called capitalism. Energia gave us a lower rate they gave us the cost rate because they were 60% shareholders in Mircorp. So if we did well, their stock would go up. And they were our operators. We were paying them for the stuff. So when you figure it all in, the day Mircorp was announced, uh, uh, Oppenheimer uh, said that the stock, of, of the, the, the stock price of Energia went up three points, which at that time was about $600 million. So from a capitalist perspective, an open market perspective, Energia was being shrewd. They weren't giving anything away. So anyway, to, to quickly wrap it up, we signed Dennis Tito. He eventually went well with Space Adventures and International Space Station because once the mirror came down, he couldn't uh, fly. Uh, but we have the, uh, we're happy to say we signed the first self-paying space ticket. And the reasons for failure, political risk too great, and uh, difficulty in rebranding. The mirror was kind of a joke at the time. Um, hopefully this will come back. Lessons learned. Uh, new generation of space entrepreneurs saw markets can be sustained. We had several phone calls with Elon Musk at the time. Uh, we had phone calls with Brits who I later realized were representing Richard Branson. And it was, a, it was data points. We were giving all of us in the community the first data points. Would someone pay for a ticket? Could Hollywood be interested? I mean, we didn't know that before. And so I'm very proud of what we did at Mircorp. I mean, we, we did sign Hollywood. We did sign Dennis Tito. We did show the private sector can work with the government at reduced costs. And so a lot of those lessons I applied in Nanorax. I mean, Nanorax is far different. It's not man. But hey, we've flown 70 payloads in two years. I got 80 payloads under contract. I've signed people all over the world. And people are like, how do you do it? Well, I learned the lessons. I learned the lessons during Mircorp. And 
And so for me alone, the, you know, that was good. I also wrote a book about being the only American to work with the Russians. Uh, it's interesting. It was an interesting time. Uh, NASA trying to get its head around its dependency on, uh, on the Russians. And so that's about it. So thank you very much. Thank you.